and in attendance, the lead plaintiff in this recent landmark case. That would be Dr. Tom Palmer. Dr. Palmer joins us live, Skyping in from Washington. Dr. Tom, thanks so much for your time and joining us here on America's Forum. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you, J.D. Uh, Tom, I want to go back to the beginning. When did this case really start and foment, and what was the catalyst that got you involved as the plaintiff? It was really the uh, Heller case, uh, which we won decisively on. I was one of the, the plaintiffs in that case uh, that was formulated by two lawyers, uh, Robert Levy, chairman of the Cato Institute, and uh, another uh, lawyer, uh, Clark Neely, from the Institute for Justice. And they thought now was the time for a serious challenge, a clean challenge to vindicate our Second Amendment rights. I had used many years earlier a handgun in self-defense. I'm alive because of it. Since that time, I've had uh, 32 years of additional life because I was able to defend myself when I needed it. And so I joined that case. That proceeded. We won. But then the district refused to obey it. The Second Amendment says the right to keep and bear arms. They very grudgingly acknowledge that you could register a firearm. It's not easy, but can be done in the district for a But they made it very clear, absolutely under no conditions could you carry it in any way in public. And we went to court again and said, that's not what the Second Amendment says. It's not what the Supreme Court affirmed. There's a fundamental and enumerated right in the Constitution to keep and bear arms. And bear does not mean moving from the den into the kitchen. It means being able to bear it for purposes of uh, self-defense. Well, Dr. Tom, up until, up until 2008, the District of Columbia had a total ban on handgun ownership. Why do you think it took so long within the district for that ban to be ruled unconstitutional? Uh, well, it took a long time for some uh, smart people who believe in our Constitution to formulate the right strategy. It was very difficult to get in for one reason, as we discovered in the D.C. case. Uh, the District of Columbia has an unusual standing rule, that is to say, uh, determining who has the right or the power to bring a lawsuit. And under the standing rule in D.C., you had to have already been arrested and and processed by the legal system before you had standing. That was outrageous and bizarre. It meant if the D.C. government banned the practice of religion, you couldn't go to court for fear that your First Amendment rights would be violated. You actually had to already be in prison for practicing Christianity or Judaism or Islam or Hinduism or whatever. That was a crazy ruling, and it made it very hard to get before the uh, District Court of Appeals. We did succeed in that case because we had one legal document that they had denied and did so in writing an attempt to get a permit. I tried that and they were clever and they refused to even deny me the permit. They wouldn't even tell me the names of the people in the city hall. Everyone turned their badges over and turned down their name plates uh, so that I wouldn't be able to bring a lawsuit. But we, we persevered, we won in that case. It took a long time and then we only got half of the Second Amendment uh, realized or vindicated uh, in practice in the district. So we had to go back in court and give them another lesson in constitutional law. And so which, you've, the you've, Second Amendment applies. You've done that, but there are still a lot of critics within the environs of the District of Columbia, including the mayor of Washington, D.C. Let's listen to what the mayor had to say, and then I'd like to get your reaction. Take a listen. We're very troubled by this. One of the things we're trying to do is fully understand what the implications of this uh, this ruling uh, are. Uh, Tom, you hear that from the mayor, uh, and you've been talking about the Constitution. Uh, your take on what the mayor had to say. Well, he's puzzled about the implications of the Constitution actually applying in the nation's capital. That's one of the things I find uh, very puzzling myself. Uh, it's as if uh, the First Amendment were to be upheld for the right to freedom of speech, for the free exercise of religion, and he would say, we're puzzled by the implications of that. Well, the implications are you have to obey the law. Now, it also means, though, one other thing, uh, and here I'll give them a little bit of uh, space, and that is that there are reasonable time, place, and manner regulations governing the uh, exercise of even fundamental rights. 
you have the right to freedom of expression, but maybe not in my neighborhood at 2.30 in the morning with a bullhorn in front of my house, uh, waking up everybody in the neighborhood. Uh, but that does not mean that that extends to a complete ban. The D.C. government's position and the mayor's position, we'll see if they continue it, has been that the, the power, the authority to establish reasonable time, place, and manner regulations extends to banning it. If they read the Constitution as they have interpreted the Second Amendment, it means that they could legitimately, under the First Amendment, shut down every church, every mosque, every synagogue, and every temple in the District of Columbia. That that's what free exercise of religion means. That cannot be true. It's a completely childish and crazy position, and the court has educated them in the meaning of the law. Uh, they should sit down with their lawyers and realize that they got licked, they were wrong, and just begin to uh, recognize our constitutional rights in D.C. Tom, less than a minute remains. The uh, Concealed Carries National Conference is today. You're going to be speaking about uh, your case publicly there. Uh, in about 30 seconds, what's the message you want to convey? Uh, the Constitution is not something that can be abrogated at will by uh, any government in the United States. It is the supreme law of the land. If they don't like it, they could try to amend it. Good luck, but that would be within their, their legal powers. But they cannot ignore it. We have the right under the Constitution to keep and bear arms. It's really that simple. It's a matter of the rule of law. Dr. Tom Palmer, a good note on which to end our discussion. We thank you for your time so much today. Thank you. Good luck with your remarks. Now, that's Dr. Palmer's take. What's yours? Why don't you tweet us your comments at Newsmax TV, hashtag America's Forum. And the way I see it, among other things, coming up next.